We take the whole mountain top off. These were forest lands before they were disturbed for coal mining activity. And so what we would like to do is to reclaim them in such a way that we can get forest lands reestablished on those. This, my presentation today is the topic that I did my research on at the University of Kentucky. And actually it's the research that went into my dissertation for my doctorate degree. Uh, Don, Dr. Graves, um, it was chair of the forestry department. It was a forestry project. And so he was a huge asset for me. And Dr. Swigard was my advisor and he was the chair of the mining engineering department where I did my work. So what we have found is that trying to get trees to grow again after reclamation can be very difficult. Um, SMACRA, the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act, which was passed into law in August of 1977, requires us to reclaim surface mine sites to a use that is equal to or better than what existed on that site before we disturbed it to mine. So since a lot of these were forest lands, we decided to look into what we could do to get forest lands reestablished. In other words, trees that have value that every 20 to 25 years we can harvest them. So that's what we were really looking for out of this project. But the problem is, since SMACRA, we've had a difficult time getting trees to survive that are planted on the site. SMACRA requires, uh, there's, a, there's a requirement of SMACRA that you have to reclaim to approximately 80% of the proximal original contour. The way OSM interprets that for reforestation is 80% of all the trees you plant have to survive for at least five years. So that has become a problem with trying to reestablish forestation, reforest there, because we can't, couldn't get the trees to survive, 80% of them. What what we believed was occurring, and the research was actually set up to be able to verify this, whether our assumption was correct, was we believed that the grading practices that were established under SMACRA were overcompacting the growing media. Now, I want to point out in the Appalachian Mountains, there is no topsoil. So even though you're required to strip at least six inches of topsoil off the site, stockpile it and place it back down, the idea being that it supported vegetative growth before it was disturbed. It should do so again after it's replaced. Problem is there's no topsoil. So what we do is we identify strata layers in the geologic column that, sh that will eventually weather into soils. And that is what we put at the surface. And in 50 years, it should be soil again. So what we do typically, those are brown sandstones and shells that will do that. So, but why were the why was is the growing media over compacted well, what has happened is osm inspectors they have to approve your grading plan before you're allowed to plant your vegetation and they want it to look like a golf course so what happens what we have discovered is when you're grading that to put that surface on there if you make more than two passes with a dozer you've over compacted that growing media and so we wanted to verify that and to see what could be done to alleviate that problem should it occur. And that's what the purpose of our research was. And we, we believe that um, poor soil properties that you get from overcompacting will actually hinder the growth and development of trees because the roots cannot establish themselves back in to a great depth. So what we wanted to do, the reason is that it also, the structure is lost in the soil when it's removed and it takes a while to reestablish once we put that back in place. And that also eliminates, reduces the potential for roots having access to moisture and the nutrients in that moisture that they need to grow. So the University of Kentucky um, conducted a project. It was a 10-year research project. I worked on it for four years. And with the whole purpose to determine what the relationship is to compaction in reconstructed growing media and it's related in how it affects tree growth. This was conducted at the Starfire Surface Mine in southeastern Kentucky. And what we did was we monitored each year changes in the soil properties of the replaced growing media, trying to determine how they were actually changing. And we also monitored tree growth and survival. So it was a collaborative effort. Uh, 
The mining engineering department and my job on that project was to collect soil physical property data in the field in our reclamation cells that we constructed. The forestry department, they, what they did was they collected information on the trees that have been planted and they determined what the tree survival rate was as well as how, mu how high the trees would grow from year to year. Biosystems and agricultural engineering were also involved in the project, but they were not involved in my dissertation work, but they were um, collecting and evaluating runoff and infiltration data that was occurring at the site. So what we wanted to do was to determine what the physical properties were and how it affected tree growth. We looked at three different methods for reconstructing the growing media in each of our research cells. We also said, okay, if it's overcompacted, what can we do to alleviate that overcompaction? So we looked at two different methods of doing that. And we also said, well, maybe if we put some organic supplements on the surface, not mixing it in with the material, but putting it on the surface, maybe that would help as well. So we looked at three different methods. What we called the compacted cells were actually those that are reclaimed as the OSM OSM is Office of Surface Mining. Uh, the way their inspectors wanted it to look whenever it was finished before they would say, yes, you can go ahead and you can start planting your trees or your grasses and things. Uh, the second method we looked at was we called loose dump cells. The growing medium material was just taken there and dumped and nothing was done with it. I do want to point out that actually is a violation of the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. And we had to get a variance from the Kentucky Department of Surface Mining and Reclamation in order to be able to do that methodology. And that is actually why SMACRA was passed because coal mine operators were not reclaiming their surface mine sites. So SMACRA was passed to force them to grade them. So, and then the third was struck off, same approach. We haul the growing media in and dump it, but we only make two passes with a dozer, okay, just to put a shape on the surface. The alleviation methods, we said, well, let's go ahead and use farm equipment. So we used a, a disc being uh, an attractor. And then we said, what if we could rip it a little bit deeper? So we used the ripping arm on a D8 Caterpillar dozer to do that. The organic supplements, what we did, so each of the five methods we were evaluating, we constructed three reclamation cells for each. On one, we did not put any organic supplements on the surface. The net, another one, we put 50 tons per acre of hardwood bark chips on there. And the third one, 50 tons per acre of compost and manure and straw. We just wanted to see if it had anything. We didn't mix it in, we just put it on the surface. We then planted seven different tree species in each of the reclamation cells. These included eastern white pine, white ash, black walnut, yellow poplar, royal polonia, white oak, and northern red oak. Six of those species are actually native to the site where the mine is located. The one that wasn't is Royal Polonia. The reason we looked at it, like yellow poplar, it is a tree that is used for building wood furniture. So we, we did see there was, say there was commercial value in doing that. So this is what the compacted cells looked like when they were first constructed and the trees were planted. Notice that resembles a golf course, right? And that's what the OSM inspectors wanted to see. They wanted to see it graded in such a way that it was nice and smooth and things. But the problem is that takes multiple dozer passes. And as I've already mentioned, once you make more than two dozer passes, you've already overcompacted that growing media. And it doesn't matter whether it's topsoil. In our case, it was just rock rock that was broken from the blasting operations to remove the overburden on top of the coal. I want to point out, do you, everybody see the white things that stick up? Uh, I don't know how many of you are from Montana, you may not remember this, but back in the 90s, there was a movement by the federal government to reestablish elk in the eastern United States. And so what they did was they captured elk in Montana, took them back to the Appalachian Mountains and released them. The Star Farm Mine was the first location the elk from Montana were released. The first trees we planted, the elk came in and ate every single tree. So when we replanted them, we actually put um, plastic, those corrugated yellow cups 
sleeves on top of them so the elk couldn't eat them. That was about a $60,000 learning lesson, okay? So this shows what the loose stump cells look like. Notice there's no soil or anything on there, okay? And this picture shows what the struck off cells look like. You can see it's not piled up, but two dozer passes. That was all that was put on there. As far as ripping, this shows the tractor with the disc on it, ripping it. We were able to rip it to about 11 to 12 inches in depth. And when we used the dozer, the ripping arm on a Cat D8 dozer, you can see the rocks. We ripped a lot of the big rocks up out of there. We left them there. We did not do anything to this, but we were able to rip it 24 inches deep. So the data that we collected, uh, the mining engineering department, the data that I collected were for the mechanical resistance of the, of the soil to root growth. What we did is there is a, an item, it's called a cone penetrometer. And what it is, it's a cone, it's made out of steel, and the cone part is, on a, is 30 degrees off of the vertical. And where it comes up to the shaft, the shaft is of such a size that the hole that it drives into the ground has a surface area of one square inch. We actually used a tractor, or com uh, our tractor we had out there. We had a software packaged on a laptop computer that ran off the tractor power. And so what we did was we used the power takeoff on the tractor to drive that rod down in the ground. We had the capability of driving it as deep as 36 inches. And so what we do is we could measure yeah, we could actually measure and plot the plot of the, the force that was being applied to drive that cone into the ground. And since it was in pounds and we had a hole that was one square inch, our resistance was in PSI. So we also measured the depth to which it penetrated. We could not go any deeper than 36 inches. We had very few holes on the project that we could even get to 36 inches because it was all rock. And we also collected then bulk density data in that material. We used a dual probe nuclear density gauge to collect that. And what it is, it actually has two rods that, come down, that slide down out of it. There's nuclear um, uh, material in the tip of that. And so what we did was we actually, at various depths below the surface, with that we were able to measure bulk density because the, the radi the nuclear rays would go between the, the bottoms of the probes, so we could actually get the density at different depths below the surface, and that was important on our project to be able to do that. While we were collecting that da data, graduate students from the forestry department were out there counting the number of trees that, had that were still alive, and they would give us that information, and so that was important to the work that I actually did. So what we were actually collecting, in addition to the penetration resistance, that maximum, we took bulk density readings two inches below the surface, at six inches below the surface, and if it went deeper at the maximum depth, and if it was deeper than 12 inches, we did it every six inches as you went down into the hole for that, that information. And we did that for all 15 reclamation cells that were constructed at the site. And so we went out, it took us about a month to collect the data. It took the, it took the forestry students all summer to get theirs because they had a lot more stuff to account for than what we, what we did. What we did was as we worked on the project, we actually wrote manuscripts and got those peer reviewed and published um, as each step along the project as we identified things that we thought were worth sharing with the community. We would write the papers. And so the first um, paper that we published, we reported that, the re that there is a correlation between the, compact, the methods used to apply to construct the growing media, especially how much compaction they put into that media, and tree survival rates. And we found that the lower tree survival rates were associated with those that had maximized compaction in the growing media as it constructed it. The second paper that we published, we reported on the ripping with the tractor and the dozer, and we reported that it does improve the, the soil physical properties because we had data that proved that. 
And we also said there definitely is a correlation between those positive properties that you get and tree survival rates. And we also pointed out that the deeper that you rip the growing media, the better, the greater your tree survival rates actually were that you would achieve in those reclamation cells. The third paper that we published was actually the results of my dissertation. And we reported three different things in that. What I did was I took the tree survival data and the penetration depth and the penetration resistance data and the bulk density data and I did um, linear regression analyses on there and developed equations for those data sets. And so if you have a site that you've reclaimed in the past and you want to get trees to grow on it, if you go out and you collect the same data that I collected, the penetration resistance, the bulk density, et cetera, on there, you can plug that information into those equations and you will get a number that predicts what your tree survival rate should be on that site. So that was the one, one thing we, we reported. The second thing that was reported, I developed procedures that if you want to have reforestation as your reclamation method, that you should follow in constructing your growing media. Specifically, how the material is placed and how the equipment operates on there to minimize getting excess levels of compaction in that material. And then I also developed procedures that you could follow if you have excess compaction and you want to release that. The fourth manuscript that we published reported on the application of organic supplements. And as I suspected, I don't know if anybody else did, I'm sure I wasn't the only one, there simply was no relationship. We, have, we didn't find any proof that just going out there and throwing a bunch of wood chips and manure out there was actually going to make the growing media any softer. But we did publish that as well. The final paper that we published on there actually reported the results of the 10 years on the project. We, we did not find any identifiable relationship between tree survival and penetration resistance. Okay, that took a lot of work to collect data that didn't tell us anything. But that's part of research. So, what we, but what we did find is that over 10 years, maximum penetration depth did increase over time. We also found that the bulk density at the two inch depth um, decreased over time, as well as the dry bulk density at the six inch depth. We didn't have enough data at deeper depths than six inches to really to really be able to justify doing the regression analyses with those. But what this is telling us is simply that over time and growing stuff there, it actually loosens up the growing media is what we found in the 10 years. And we were not surprised to find that. This is a plot of the 10 years of data for the maximum penetration depth. This is a plot for the compaction at the two inch depth. Now, I know that this looks weird, and the reason we think this happened is I worked on the project from 1999 to 2002, and I discovered that the nuclear density gauge was not working correctly, and so we actually had to send it back to the manufacturer to have some things repaired in it and have it reconstructed and recalculated. And from 1999 on, you can see a more consistent trend. So we think the data from 97 to 98 is an aberration and it's no good. But I still used it in the linear regression analyses. Okay, I did not throw any data points out uh, in that. We used everything to say, what do we get? Okay, and the number, we didn't get anything that looked off the wall, so we left everything. And I did have a statistics person who was on my committee that worked with me on this. So we're pretty confident that. And you can see here then is the change over, over time for the six inch depth as well. So what we found on our project over 10 years is a really good correlation between tree growth and the soil, those soil physical properties that we monitored on the project. And again, as I already mentioned, um, that it does loosen up over time and we also found a gradual convergence. What we did was the compacted methods had much higher compaction levels in the growing media than what either the loose dumped or the struck off did. But we found out over time, 
that those numbers actually converge. So given 10 years, all three methods pretty much gave the same growing media out there for the trees. And as I mentioned, the growing media loosening up, this was to be expected because this simply, it was all rock, as you saw, where the rip, one with the rip with the dozer cells. Uh, you just get weathering and decomposition of that. In fact, that's why it's near the surface because over time it will actually weather and decompose into a topsoil. It may take 50 years, but eventually it will. But there's natural freezing and thawing. The Appalachian Mountains does have winters and it does have summers. It gets about 46 to 48 inches of moisture a year. So that actually helps with um, those two methods anyway. Plus the growth of the roots as it penetrates down in reestablishes the structure in the soils, which makes it better for getting water um, in through the growing media. And when you get the water in there, you get the nutrients that are in that water. And so that can be up taken by the plants to growth. What we have here, this was typical tree growth in a compacted cell after five years. And what I want to point out on here, every tree in these cells were planted on a six foot by six foot center. Okay, so in our cells that gave us approximately 2,000, 4,250 trees planted in each cell. If you look at this, you don't see a whole lot of trees. There's one here, here's one there. See a lot of areas with nothing growing. Okay, and that was, what we're saying is OSM was wrong, is the whole gist behind this. Okay, and actually, on average, over, by the time I did my dissertation, I had seven years of data, and on average, only one out of every four trees that were planted in the compaction cells were still alive, had survived. What's the scale of that picture, Paul? Uh, you said you planted them every six feet. Every six feet. feet. Is that so, feet? Is that six feet, four feet? Here to here is about six feet. Okay. okay. So it's like 30 feet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This shows typical tree growth in the struck off cells after five years. You can see a lot more trees and they're a lot bigger. Okay, again, that growing media was not as compacted when the trees were planted as they were with the, compaction, the compacted methods. This shows typical tree growth um, in the loose stump cells after five years. And while you might say, well, I don't see as many trees, but notice the big rocks here, it just was different. If you think back to the picture I showed, what it looked like when the material was first dumped, okay, you're seeing that actually out here. Okay, with the big rocks at the surface. This shows typical tree growth after four years in a tractor rip cell. And you have to look a little more closely. This is probably a little bigger than the 30 feet on the other two, because I was a little further away to take it. But you can actually see, if you look closely there, you can actually see that there are a lot of trees out there. The reason four years, the project originally started with the three compaction methods. And the following year, then we constructed the the rec, uh, ripping cells. So they were actually less than a year. This shows typical tree growth in a loose, in a ripped one with a tractor. You can see the much bigger rocks out there. And so it's pretty neat. You also notice the fence there. We decided after a while the cheapest way to save the trees from the elk was to put a fence up. We actually had a cell, a photo cell that charged a battery. And it actually, if, a, if anything touched that, it actually released 30,000 volts of electricity into whatever touched it. it. It wouldn't kill them, but they would, trust me, they didn't touch it again. because They stayed out of it. And I love this picture. This is typical tree growth in a loose dump cell after 10 years. Okay, so clearly we have reestablished a forest on there. Okay, and in 10 more years after that, we probably could go in there and harvest the trees. They would be, have a large enough diameter that they could actually be harvested and cut for wood that could be sold. We're not looking for firewood. Okay, what we planted are, are trees that have value for lumber, for building lumber, for building furniture, for building baseball bats, which made sense because Kentucky, that's where Louisville is and that's where Hillerich and Bradsby has a factory that makes baseball bats, is in Louisville, Kentucky. So we were pretty excited. We think that even though the project is completed, 
we think that it was a success. One of the things I pointed out is that the more compacted the growing media is, the more difficult it is for the roots to penetrate to depth, to have access to enough water and nutrients to survive. This clearly prints out. Now my committee said, okay, you're telling me this, prove it. So what I did is I went out to the site and in each of the different reclamation cells, I picked out the ones that had no applied organic substance supplements on the surface. I also picked out the, the red oak trees and I picked out trees that were all 20 inches in height. So I wanted every tree to be the same. And I dug up one from each of the cells. This grew in the struck off cell. Notice multiple tap roots coming out of there. And as Jim Ringe, one of the investigators on the project from the forestry department, told me that tree will never die. Okay? Because it is so well established out there. Now this one, the loose stump may not look as good, but what I want to point out, and this was something I would have never dreamed of had I not dug this tree up. Okay? You do not have to have topsoil to grow stuff. You have to have nutrients, but you don't have to have topsoil. No topsoil on this site. This actually is as well developed here as this is. This is, but it doesn't show up in this picture on this poster. This, the tree grew down and grew around a rock and came back down and reestablished the root system under that rock. Okay, that was an interesting tree to try to dig out without damaging the root system. Okay, this then is the normal method, our compacted. And as Jim Ringe said, this looks like a carrot. That tree has a, no more than a 10 year life on it. And then this is with the dozer rip sail. This is a tractor rip. Notice this, it comes down, it goes across. I said we ripped to about 11, 12 inches with the tractor. Okay, the root system got down there at that depth that was still over compacted. And it could not penetrate, the root could not penetrate any deeper on that. So what it did, it got down to that. At the bottom of the ripping, it started following the top down there. But at two feet, it's still going strong down here on the tractor rips, on the dozer rip cells. So what we did is we're rec we rec the procedures for handling spoil or, or soil, either one during construction of growing media, is you want to keep the equipment off of it. The coal industry used to use um, pan scrapers, to vote, they do to remove topsoil. But they used to use it to apply it because it comes, it spreads it out on the bottom. The problem is the four tires on the pan scraper create the highest compaction rate of any piece of mobile equipment that is used on a surface mine site. Okay, so what we recommend is to use a truck, haul the material in on an off-road truck, dump it, and then use a dozer to place it in as thick as lift as you're going to construct. We also recommend that that piece of equipment be low ground pressure. Now Caterpillar makes a lot of equipment. Low ground pressure is a specific type. It has a wider track on it than what they normally put on their dozers. Okay, so that also reduces the loading because loading is, the pressure of loading is equal to the surface area, the weight divided by the surface area. So the, wide, the bigger the surface area that, that it occupies on the, the tracks of the dozer, the lower the pressure is in constructing the growing media. We also said that no more than two passes with a dozer and eliminate backblading. Okay, you've all seen, probably all seen dozer operators. They push a pile of material, spread it out, lower the blade back down, pull it backwards to put a nice smoother surface. What you're doing, that's now two passes with that dozer. Okay, the first one when it bladed it, the second one it back bladed it, that's your two passes on that. So no more than two passes. And finally, for reforestation, you don't, the tree saplings, when you, they're only about eight to 10 inches high when you plant them. You, you do have to plant grasses and other things because you have to minimize potential soil erosion from the site, from snow melt and rainfall activities with runoff. Uh, so what you want to do is something that's non-competitive and low growth. And that's important. If it's something that's going to grow, like for example, legumes, like fescue, stuff like that, it'll grow three feet high and it'll, kill, it'll actually kill off the tree seed saplings that you planted. So you want something that's not going to grow more than about six inches and doesn't require a lot of moisture. 
Uh, there is an organization called the Appalachian Regional Reforestation Initiative. This is their website. It, they are dedicated. It's a group of regulatory agencies and researchers and universities and mining companies, etc., that are dedicated to reclaiming surface mine sites to reestablish forest lands. I would suggest you go out and look at their website. They have about 14 or 15 different publications out there on different things they recommend that you can follow that will enhance your ability to get the trees to survive long term. And just, I guess, to toot my own horn, um, my dis dissertation is actually referenced in several of those publications. By the way, my dissertation is available out there as a PDF. Okay, if you just type it in, it'll actually come up. So what do we find? Within 10 years, you can get an adequate growing media on your reclaimed site that will support long-term survival and growth of trees. It's important. And it doesn't matter which of the three methods you use to construct your growing media. But there is, there is a downside to using the other methodology. What we found, and this was surprising to me too, the first two years of tree growth are the most critical. Once a tree survives two years, more than likely it's going to survive long term. So what we did was we saw a leveling off of tree survival rates after two years. Okay, now the Royal Polonia, every single tree we planted out there died. It didn't survive. So I guess you, if you want it, you have to go to Japan or China to get that for building your furniture. But anyway, we found out that after two years that tree survival rates had stabilized on the site. So how you construct your growing media has a huge impact on what happens in those first two growing seasons. If you're a mining company and you want to reforest, is that your post mining option? You've got two choices. You can either stabilize the site and wait 10 years and plant your trees, or you can simply use loose stumped or struck off method and go ahead and plant the trees during your normal reclamation cycle. Uh, I want to thank the, Robin, the University of Kentucky's Robinson Forest Trust Fund. They actually funded the research project that I worked on. And also the U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Energy both kicked in money. You can thank um, McConnell, Mitch McConnell for that little bonus that he threw to us on that project. Um, it was $6 million over three years, so it was a substantial earmark. And finally, Trinity Coal Partners and their predecessors gave us access to the Starfire Mine to allow us to construct this, conduct this research project. Questions? Yes? So, about how many passes did you have to do when you were ripping with the dozer, and did that influence any more compaction while you were ripping with the dozer? No, it was ripped with the dozer, so it was already low ground pressure. And as far as the spacing, it was just the dozer just made a pass every width of the dozer. Okay. There was, we didn't go out and stake it out or anything. That was just the approach. Yes? So the uh, struck off cells had two dozer passes. Do you know an average number of the compacted cells, like how many times the dozer would pass over them? To get it to look like that, I'd say between five and ten. Okay, okay a lot. I mean, it looked pretty smooth. It was obviously it wasn't as smooth a walk out there as what it looked because there's no topsoil, so you do have rocks at the surface. Okay, but I wasn't there when they they constructed the cells initially. But my guess is easily five to ten passes on a dozer. You had to make the inspector happy. And they used like the full size dozers every time for those passes, right? They didn't like no settle it out with. Uh... They, um, the mining industry uses D11 dozers right. for reclamation. So a D11 dozer, the blade on it is probably uh, from about here to here in width. Okay, that's about the width of a blade on a D11 dozer. They're the big ones. Right. Okay. Uh, did they ever consider like the first pass or two to get things mostly settled using the D11s and then scaling down? No, because the they don't buy a lot of, they only buy the equipment they actually need. The D11s are necessary to grade the spoil piles, okay, because you might have rocks the size of a tractor trailer in there. They have to, because it's been blasted, a drag line was used to move it. Drag lines are huge. 
Okay, an 80 cubic yard bucket on a drag line is big enough you can park a school bus inside of it and still have room to get around.